I usually sit for an, an hour. If I'm going to lecture, I've been doing a lot of Q and A's and that's a little easier, but if I'm going to lecture, I have to sit for an hour and then I think, okay, what question am I trying to investigate? I have to have that. So that's the point. What mystery am I trying to unravel? It's usually associated with one of the rules in my book because technically it's a book tour, but each of those rules is an investigation into an ethic and each of them points to a deeper sort of mystery in some sense. And there's no end to the amount it can be explored. And so I have the question. My question might be something like, uh, put your put your house in perfect order before you criticize the world. Okay. What does that mean exactly? Put your, what does house mean? What does put what does put mean, that active verb? What does perfect and order mean? Why before you criticize the world? What does it mean to criticize? What does it mean to criticize the world? How can you do that properly or improperly? So I start to think about how to decompose the question. And, and you start to think which of these decompositions are important to really dig into. Yeah, well, then they'll strike me. It's like, okay, there's something there that, that I've been maybe noodling around on that I would like to investigate further. And then I think, okay, how can I approach this problem? I think, well, I have this story that I know I have this story and I have this story, but I haven't juxtaposed them before. And there's going to be some interesting interaction in the juxtaposition. So I have the question and I kind of have a framework of interpretation. And then I have some potential narrative places I can go. And then I think, okay, I can go juggle that and see what happens. And so then what I want to do is concentrate on that process while attending to the audience to make sure that the words are landing and then see if I can delve into it deeply enough so that a narrative emerges spontaneously with an ending. Now, I'm sure you've experienced this in podcasts, right? Maybe I'm wrong, but my experience has been if I fall into the conversation and we know about the time frame, there'll be a natural narrative arc. And then, so you'll kind of know when the midpoint is and you'll kind of see when you're reaching a conclusion. And then if you really pay attention, you can see that's a good place to stop. And it's kind of, you come to a point and you have to be alert and patient to see that. And you have to be willing to be satisfied with where you've got to. But if you do that, and then it's like a comedian making the punchline work. It's like, I've got all these balls in the air and they're going somewhere. And this is how they come together. And people love that, right? To say, mm -hmm. oh, this and this and this and this and this. Whack. Together. And that's an insight. And it is very much like a punchline. Well, that's so, interesting because your mind actually. Some, I'm a fan of your podcast too, and you are always driving towards that. I would say, for me, in in, in, a, in a podcast conversation, there's often a kind of uh, Alice in Wonderland type of exploration down the rabbit hole, man. And then you just a new thing pops up. And the more absurd, the wilder, the better. Yeah, conversations with Elon are like this. Yeah, I bet. it's like. Actually, the more you drive towards an arc, the more uncomfortable you start to get mm -hmm. in a fun, absurd conversation because, oh, I, I'm i now one of the normies. No, I don't want that. I mm -hmm. wanna be, I want I want the rabbit. I want the crazy. Yeah. So that, because it makes it more uh, fun. But yeah. somehow throughout it, there is wisdom that you try to grasp at well, such that there is a thread to Well, the that's the thing, man. You're following the thread, eh? Yeah, the threads. Try, the, the thre try. Well, that's right. You're, that's what we're trying to do. That thread, that thread is the proper balance between structure and spontaneity, and it manifests itself as the instinct of meaning, and that's the logos in the dialogos, and it really is the logos. And God only knows what that means. You know, I mean, the the biblical claim is that logos is the fundamental principle of reality, and I think that's true. I actually think that's true. Because I think that that meaning that guides you, well, here's a way of thinking about it. I've been writing about this recently. What's real? Matter. It's like, okay, that's one answer. What's real? What matters is real. Because that's how you act. Okay, so that's different than matter. It's like, okay, what's the most real of what matters? How about pain? Why is it the most real? Try arguing it away. Good luck. So pain is the fundamental reality. All right. Well, that's rough. Doesn't that lead to nihilism and hopelessness? 
Yeah, doesn't it lead to a philosophy that's antithetical towards being? The most fundamental reality is pain. Yes. Is there anything more fundamental than pain? Love. Really? If you're in pain, love and truth, that's what you got. And you know, If they're more powerful than pain, maybe they're the most real things. When you think about reality, what is real? That is the most real thing. Well, it, it's a tough one, right? Because you have to, because if you're a scientist, a materialist, think, well, the matter is the most real. It's like, well, you don't know what the matter is. Yeah. And so, and then when push comes to shove, and it will, you'll find out what's most real. I, I feel like this is uh, missing physical reality is is missing some of the things. So of course, pain has a biological component and all those kinds of things, but it, it it's missing something deep about the human condition that at least the modern science is not able to uh, describe. But is it is reaching towards that? Yeah, it and is. It's the reason. It, one one way to describe it as you're describing is the reason is reaching it is because underneath of science is this assumption that there's a deep logos thing to this whole thing we're trying to do. Well, you know, there's two traditions, right? In some sense, there's two logos traditions. There's the the Greek rational enlightenment tradition. That's a logos tradition, and it insists that there's a logos in nature and that science is the way to approach it. And then there's the Judeo-Christian logos, which is more embodied and more spiritual. And I would say the West is actually an attempt to unite those two. And it's the proper attempt to unite those two, because they need to be united. And I see the union coming in near terms. You know, I, I talked to Franz de Waal, for example, about the animating principle of chimpanzee sovereignty. And that's pretty close biologically. Is it power? because that's the claim, even from the biologists often. The most dominant chimp has the best reproductive success. It's like, oh yeah? Dominant, eh? You mean using compulsion? Okay, let's look. Are the chimps who use compulsion the most successful? And the answer is sporadically and rarely. And for short, well, that's sporadically, for short periods of time. Why? Because they meet an unpleasant end. The subordinates over whom they exercise arbitrary control wait for a weak moment and then tear them into shreds, right? Every dictator's terror, and for good reason. And DeWall has showed that the alpha chimps, the males, who do have preferential mating access often, are often and reliably the best peacemakers and the most reciprocal. And so even among chimps, the principle of sovereignty is something like iterative, iterated reciprocity. And that's a way better principle than power. And it's something like, I've been thinking, what's the antithesis of the spirit of power? I think it's the spirit of play. And you know, you, I don't know what you think about that, but when you have a good podcast conversation, you already described it in some sense as play. It's like there's a structure, right? Because it's an ordered conversation but you want there to be play in the system. And if you get that right, then it's really engaging. Mm -hmm. And then it seems to have its own narrative arc. I'm not trying to impose that, even though that's another thing I don't do. I didn't come to this conversation at all, thinking here's what I want out of a conversation with Lex Friedman. Like instrumentally, I thought, I'll go talk to Lex. Why? I like his podcasts. He, he's doing something right. I don't know what it is. He asks interesting questions. I'll go have a conversation with him. Where's it going to go? Wherever it goes. Embracing the spirit of play. So what you have this when you're lecturing, you're going in front of the crowd. Yeah. You thought of a question. Yeah. You, you, you get on the stage. First of all, are you nervous at all? I'm very nervous when I'm sitting down, thinking through the structure initially, which is why my wife and I have been doing Q&As, and that's easier on me. Yeah. 
it's the uh <laughs> it's the the way comedians are nervous like uh Joe Rogan just did his special so this weekend and so he now has to sit nervously like a comedian does which is like I have no material now right I have to start well, from that's scratch it. when I was doing the lectures constantly instead yeah. of the Q and A's yes. basically what I was doing was writing a whole book chapter every night and, you know, now that's a bit of an exaggeration because I would return to themes that I had developed, but it's not really an exaggeration because I didn't ever just go over rote material, ever. So it was it's very demanding, and that part's nerve-wracking because I sit down, it's an hour before the show, and I think, can I, can I do this? And, you know, the answer is, well, you did it a thousand times. <laughs> but that's not this time. Yeah. It's like, can I come up with a question? Can I think through the structure? Can I pull off the spontaneous narrative? Can I pull it together? And the answer is, I don't know. Yeah. And so then I get it together in my mind, I think. And that's hard. It, it takes effort and it's nerve wracking. Okay, I got it. But then there's the moment you go out on stage and you think, well, I know I had it, but can I do it? No notes. Yeah. And then the question is, well, you're going to find out while well, you do it. And so then I go out on stage and I don't talk to the audience. I talk to one person at a time. And you can talk to one person, you know, because you know how to do that. So I talk to a person and not too long because I don't want to make them too nervous. And then someone else and someone else. And then I'm in contact with the audience. And then I can tell if the words are landing and I listen. It's like, are they rustling around? Are they dead quiet? Because you want dead you, quiet. You, you're so, oh, I see. That's what focus sounds like. They, you're right. you're in it together then. You bet. Well, and I also, here's a good rule if you're learning to speak publicly. I never say a word till everyone is 100% quiet. And that's, it's a great way to start a talk because you're set in the frame, eh? And if the frame is, well, I'll talk while you're talking, the message is, well, you can talk. This is a place where everybody can talk. It's like, no, it's not. This is a place where people paid to hear me talk. So I'm not going to talk till everyone's listening. And so then you get that stillness. And then you just wait, because that stillness turns into an expectation. And then it comes turns into a kind of nervous expectation. It's like, what the hell is he doing? It's not manipulative. It's a sense of timing. It's like, just when that's right, you think, okay, now it's time to start. Well, that nervous, the interesting thing about that nervous expectation is from an audience perspective, we're in it together. Yeah. I mean, there is, into that silence, there's a togetherness to it. Of course. It's the union of everyone's attention. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, and that's a great thing. I mean, you love that at a concert when everyone, it's not silence then, but when everyone's attention is unified and everyone's moving in unison, it's like we're all worshiping the same thing, right? It's, and that would be the point of the conversation, the point of the, lecture and the worship is the direction of attention towards it and it's un it's communion because everyone's doing it at the same time and so i mean there's not much difference between lecture theater and a church in that regard right it's the same fundamental layout and structure and they're very integrally associated with one another one really grew out of the other the lecture theater grew out of the church so it's it's perfectly reasonable to be thinking about it in those terms 